Welcome to Bullshift the Podcast. My name is John DeGuy. I'm the author of Bullshift the Book and the host of the podcast, which is a podcast that talks about behavioral investing for retail clients to help people understand how behavioral factors have an impact on whatever decisions we make as we go about our investing journey. My guest this week is Rodrigo Gordillo, and Rodrigo's an uh, industry veteran. He's the president and a portfolio manager at Resolve Asset Management. He's got over 15 years of experience in investment management. He has co-authored the book, Adaptive Asset Allocation, which is what I have right here. We'll be talking about that later on. Dynamic Global Portfolios to Profit in Good Times and Bad from Wiley. Uh, he actually co-hosts a podcast of his own, which is the Gestalt University podcast. He's written several white papers. He's done research focused on adding new insights to the quantitative global asset allocation space. And he and his team develop systematic multi-asset long-short investment strategies with private hedge funds, mutual funds, and ETFs for investors in Canada, the United States, and offshore. That's a mouthful, Rodrigo. You do a lot of stuff. You know, we've often thought that we might have taken on more than we could chew, but uh, <laughs> it's a passion, so, you know, at least we're not bored. Well, thank you for joining us this week. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on. I've been, uh, you know, I've heard you speak and I've read your book, and it's one of those things where, uh, there are certain people that you think, okay, when, when the time comes and you do a podcast, who do you want to have on? And, and you were always one of the people that I thought would be a, a wonderful guest because you're such a wealth of knowledge. And, and also because you're what I would call a bit of an out-of-the-box thinker. The way you look at the world is, is more uh, holistic and not quite as uh, simple and compartmentalized the way a lot of other people would do things. So I'm wondering if you could start, and I've heard you start with this before, I think that's a great way to begin, by talking about your formative years and how it sort of got you thinking about an all-terrain philosophy toward uh, managing money. Yeah, no, thank you for those kind words, John. And uh, I think a lot of my orthogonal thinking really comes down to luck, good, uh, bad, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and it did start in my formative years. I was born and raised in Lima, Peru. Um, we, you know, when I was in Peru, it was a, it was a time of turmoil. There was a lot of political unrest going from military government to a new democracy. The, uh, president at the time, Alan Garcia had done a lot of money printing and had, uh, taken a stance with the global community of one of that it was going to try to produce everything internally, very populist. And in 1989, the year uh, 88, 89, when we moved, before we moved to Canada, uh, inflation went from around 20% to 7,200% <laughs> in a matter of six months, right? So for me- I don't think they've got it bad now. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, as a Latin American, you know about inflation when you speak with North Americans, they often up until last year, or this year even have thought that it was just not a, it was a thing of the past that it wasn't going to happen again. Um, well, in Latin America, we live it over and over again, not so much in Peru after 89, but certainly, um, certainly that time and, and sadly, you know, one of the, the biggest things that really stuck with me at the time was that my grandfather, who was a lifelong accountant, had retired, had written a letter to all of his um, kids saying that he didn't, they didn't need to worry about him, that he had worked hard, saved hard, and it pays off at the end of all that working and saving to, um, to make sure you're not a burden on your family. Sadly, he had all of his money in Peruvian dollars, and within a year, that equivalent to U.S. dollar was about a million dollars. So the story goes, uh, it went to zero in real purchasing power. And so sadly, we did have to help him out. He did have to start working here and there. He, luckily, his, what he worked in was his passion, which is rowing. Um, but, you know, it was just an, an eye-opening experience. And then you get to Canada, uh, 1989, 1990. We were able to buy property for nearly zero money down right before a 50% housing market crash. So concentration hits again. And, uh, and then I saw it again during the tech crisis, right? As I was going through school, seeing family members invest in the uh, stock market, thinking that that was the next best thing right before another 50, 60% drawdown, 70, if you're, if you're focused on, on growth stocks and tech. So that really, you know, again, bad luck, 
leads to deeper thinking, I think. And that led me to to approaching the world of investing from a, from a different angle. One of the things you talk about uh, frequently, actually, is that history teaches us that there are blind spots, blind spots associated with the 60-40 portfolio. And I'm wondering if you can maybe talk about that, because we've talked about 60-40 in the past on, on this podcast, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Well, look, when... When all those things happened to me and I went out on the field and tried to interview financial professionals, investors, and advisors, I found that largely the focus was on security selection. So buying domestic stocks and domestic bonds, for the most part. If you were Canadian, you're mostly focused on Canada. If you were U.S., you're mostly focused on the U.S. But there was no talk of anything beyond equities and bonds. And if you went back and, and looked at the history of financial markets from the lens of inflation, you quickly realize that equities and bonds do not do well in inflationary regimes. So a 60-40 portfolio, 60% equities, 40% bonds. If you go to the 70s, you go to the 20s, you go to the mid 40s, you'll find that they have, they struggle, right? They struggle. And when there's inflationary thrusts, it tends to break things as well. So you're not only having to deal with inflation issues as rates go up and the Fed uh, increases rates, what you're having is a discount rate pushing both asset classes down. So that already has this idea that equities and bonds move in different directions uh, up on its head. It doesn't, it doesn't always happen that way. And then once inflation kind of wreaks havoc, then we have a bear market often. Mm -hmm. And so those are the two major blind spots, right? Number one, inflation leads to both equities and bonds to go down. And the second one, the bear market tends to make equities go down, but bonds go up. Sadly, the 60-40 portfolio is unbalanced in terms of risk, where 60% of the risk uh, of the dollars go to equity. But if we put our, our risk goggles on and we can measure that, you'll find that a 60-40 portfolio actually has 90% of the risk in equities and 10% to bonds. So in a bear market, your, 60, your bond por portfolio isn't enough to offset the losses of your equity portfolio. So those are the two major blind spots, right? Bear markets like 08, like 2000, and inflation regimes like we've seen this year. So this is, I think, a good point, a good part to actually hand, once again hold up a copy of the book, which when you when you look it into the camera, it's upside down and inverse, so it's hard to read. But uh, the book is called Adaptive Asset Allocation. You co-wrote it with uh, Adam Butler and Mike Philbrick. It came out in 2016, I think. Yeah, 15, I think, is when we, we were done writing it. I'm not sure when it was published. Yeah, I, I, I just checked out. I wanted to read something from the, from the inner sleeve here, just so that the people can, people listening can actually... Uh, get a sense of uh, what we're talking about here, because you touched on being adaptive and, and the, the way things uh, might change in certain regimes. So what you write is, the first hurdle most investors must overcome is their own cognitive wiring. As humans, we're built to thrive in a deterministic world, guided from day to day by our own experience and the signals we get from those around us. But modern markets turn our own instincts against us with randomness, extreme emotions, and the madness of crowds. That sure sounds like it was written yesterday, <laughs> not but six it, or seven years it's ago. A, it's uh, an evergreen piece of content. Uh, and, and the thing is, uh, you know, they say that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. It sure is rhyming now. And I'm wondering if you could maybe talk about how it's important to be able to invest in all manner of economic climates and, and, and to get away from the idea of regime dependency and economic shocks and just, just think about an all-weather approach to investing. Yeah, and it really comes down to, there was a part in that um, statement that has to do with whatever our neighbors and, and our lived experiences have been define the actions we're going to take. And sadly, from 1981 to last year, we have largely been dominated by a world of disinflation, so low inflation, persistent positive growth in, in the world economies, and abundant liquidity led by central bank policies. And in that environment, we can tell you up front that developed equities and developed bonds are going to be the, the winners. If, if you tell me up front that we're going to be we're gonna have low inflation and abundant growth, and abundant liquidity, I can tell you that 60-40 is likely to be the winner, right? Mm -hmm. And so if, if think about it, who's been in the business, who's, who's been managing portfolios, who has been in the advisory space, how long have they been around? 
But the large majority of us have not been around prior to 1981. So we, we are looking around and saying, hey, what am I getting uh, rewarded for here? Well, the only thing I get rewarded for is equities and developed equities and bonds, the, the thing I get the word with the most. And so you, it's not surprising that people's lived experiences have led to this type of portfolio that we address has some blind spots. But if you move away from experience and go into historical expertise, that changes things. You really just have to go beyond your lived experience, identify the pure facts of the, of the influence that high inflation and low inflation periods have on your portfolio, high growth and low growth, high liquidity, low liquidity. And you know, luckily I have, um, uh, my father's a mathematician, he was also a software developer. So I had the tools at my disposal to, to do the work and identify and map out what works when. And what you realize very quickly is that um, when you move beyond your lived experience, when you identify how the machine actually works, that there are, number one, you can identify the, the holes, and number two, that there are tools available to us today that may not have been available to us 40 years ago that allow us to protect our portfolios, be more balanced, and then if we have the chops, maybe adapt a little as well. One of the things I talk about in my book, Bullshift, is that there are biases everywhere and that we humans, it's just human to be biased. We all, we all have them. One of the ones that we talk about is recency bias. And if you think about the past 40 years, which is a 40 year long bull market in bonds because of the disinflationary growth environment that we've been in, most people who are investing today, most people listening to and watching this podcast will not have experienced any other macro environment other than disinflationary growth and, yeah. and, and, a, and a bull market in bonds. And as a result, we become hubristic, we become uh, overconfident, and we become overly optimistic based on our, our own lived experiences, which um, although real, um, it's all we know, so we think that that's all there is. But in fact, if you're a student of history, you'll find that there are in fact times when, when you know, economic growth is not that robust. And a lot of people think that's what's coming down the pike due to climate change, due, due to demographics, due to uh, debt levels. Uh, you know, people like Nouriel Roubini have, have been you know, quite critical of what uh, is expected down the road. But mm -hmm. people don't realize how blinkered they are based on what they've experienced as opposed to what they could experience or based on what their parents or grandparents experienced. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe give us a little more Maybe just a little more context about uh, about maybe past history, because you're a good student of history. Well, look, it's it, again just going back to the analogy of lived experiences. It's we, you know, you're a fish, and the fish doesn't know it's in water, right? It never asks itself that it's in water. You really have to do some deep thinking and and looking up and seeing the seagulls to realize, oh my God, there's something beyond there, and then you need to fly like the seagulls and, and identify the terrain in order to understand it. So. Look, the, if you examine the history of the 60-40 portfolio back to the 1900s, you have 1900 to 1920, you had a 20-year real return period of zero returns. You had a similar period from 1940, um, 1940s, 1950s, 15 years of, of zero returns. In the 1970s, you had two major bear markets and a zero return period for the 60-40. And by the way, we don't have to go that far to realize the bear market blind spots that we experienced from 2000 to 2010, right? So it's not like these periods of inflation happen, it's been six months and it's now over. If you truly examine history, you understand that these, once you start breaking the system with inflation, it takes years to put that genie back in the bottle. And so what I'm hearing today from advisors and investors is that, thank God, the worst of it is over. The Fed has pivoted. We're seeing inflation reduce. And the truth is that trying to really control rates like it's a dial where you, oh, you wanted a 2% and that's our target rate. Let's just go back down to two. It's just, it, it's never happened before. And it, they might overshoot to the downside. They might undershoot to the upside. Either way, you're either dealing with a bear market and, and negative growth shock, or you're dealing with inflation. And that recalibrating takes a while. And history will tell you all about it. And there's different types of inflation. There's different types of bear markets. All of that needs to be understood in order to start thinking about portfolio construction in a different way. The consensus seems to be that central bankers learned their lesson in the 70s and they raised rates, but not enough 
so that inflation persisted at, at higher levels and for longer. Uh, and it wasn't until Paul Volcker came and came, you know, riding to the rescue in the very early 80s to be exceedingly draconian in order to wrestle inflation to the ground. And, and there are now certain people who think, well, you know, you know inflation's already coming down. We've hit peak inflation. And, and so, you know, why can't central bankers uh, let up already? And uh, certainly my impression is that central bankers have been exceedingly clear. We're not going to make the mistake that we made in the 70s again. If we're going to overshoot, we're going to overshoot uh, only once we see the inflation coming way down, not just see it tickle down, you know, tr trickle down by a, by, by a tenth or, or three or four tenths of a percent, but you know, bring, bring it back down to the 2% range. And unless and until that happens, we're going to keep our, keep our foot on the brakes. And I think there's a lot of people, investors, who are sort of thinking optimistically, basically thinking in terms of what they want to happen as opposed to what they should rationally expect and they want central bankers to pivot as opposed to, well, wait a minute, isn't that a bit of mandate creep? Like central bankers have a job to maintain price stability, not to go around um, trying to manage the business cycle. And I think there are a lot of people that want the business cycle and specifically the market cycle to, to pick up. And as a result, they're sort of going around, they're going through their lives with their fingers crossed, hoping that central bankers will, will at the very least, take their foot off the brake and, and maybe even start cutting sometime soon. And I, my view is that that's optimism bias, that's wishful thinking. And there's a certain amount of cognitive dissonance because people don't want to acknowledge that we're heading into a, that 2023 is going to be almost certainly a very, very tough year, just objectively looking at, you know, the facts as, as we see them. So, um, uh, we've said don't fight the Fed for years. People learned their lesson near the end of the bull market. They finally stopped fighting the Fed, started making some returns. Now it's the other way around, and they don't yeah. like the way the Fed's doing it. They're fighting the Fed again. Yeah. They've been, made it very clear what their intent is. Now, whether their, their approach this time is correct or not, or whether it's going to go overshoot and create a massive deflationary cycle or not, it is yet to be seen. The point is that you know the Fed, the Fed's approach is very clear. They're going to do everything they can to fight inflation. We'll see what the aftermath of that is, is going to be. Okay, can you walk us through um, something related, which are the notions of diversifiable versus non-diversifiable risk? Just sort of maybe talk about those concepts. Sure thing. Yeah. So I think that the way people think about uh, diversification is um, it, it's just a little misunderstood, right? We wrote a piece years ago, it's probably in the book, that talked about 2,500 stocks and still not diversified, okay? Mm -hmm. So there is, we all get taught in our first week of finance how, you know, if you want to create a diversified portfolio, you start adding uh, different equities to the portfolio, but up until 15 stocks, you know, then there's asymptotic returns. You don't, you don't actually get the, uh, you don't get much more value from diversifying equities. And so people have believed that that's kind of all you need. And if you add more and more equities, you certainly don't have, an, you don't have added diversification. And the problem with that equity focused approach to diversification is that you are getting exposure to an asset class, which is the equity asset class, private equity, private debt, all those kind of fall in the same category that are going to thrive in periods of uh, persistent growth and are going to crash when there is negative growth shocks. Okay, so by, be, by putting together a portfolio of 100% equities, you are taking on risk that you're not gonna necessarily get paid for. Right? You're taking on 15, 20% annualized volatility that you can actually reduce and increase your return for every unit of risk that you take, right? So equities historically have had 0.3 units of return to every unit of risk. We're talking about uh, US equities. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is there a way to get paid for the risk that I take in a much more thoughtful way? When this is where the, the 40 of the 60-40 comes in, right? And it used to be government bonds because government bonds do go up as a um, as liquidity dries up in equities when people go to safety as long as there's no inflation involved so with government bonds you are offsetting like a two piston motor you're offsetting the losses in equities in in the time that you need it and so when you do that when you put equities and bonds together all of a sudden you're you're getting about 0.5 units of return for every unit of risk. You just added 20 basis points of return 
mm -hmm. right? And, and for the same level of risk, you can choose the risk that you want now. If you want 20%, 15% annualized risk like equities, you can just grab your 60, 40 portfolio and borrow a little bit of money to get to the same level of risk as equities. And now you're going to get more money for the same amount of risk. And this is where the, the word comes, uh, whether you're going to get paid for it or not, you can choose your equity portfolio or you can choose a 60, 40 portfolio. And in the equity, if you just choose to stay with equities, you're not getting paid for the risk that you're taking. You're only getting paid 0.3 units, right? Now think about inflation and the things that you could do there. What if you start adding treasury inflation protected securities? right, that can deal with inflation? What if you add commodity, a solid, well-diversified commodity ETF in your portfolio? All of a sudden, you can increase that, that uh, return per unit of risk up to 0 0.6, 0 0.65, right, depending on how you diversify, maybe 0.7. For the same level of risk, now you're getting paid more. And too, too often, people choose the first option, and they're leaving money on the table. They've taken the same amount of risk, and they're not getting paid for it. What you're talking about really is is the notion of risk parity, and and you've you've been sort of dancing around it. I'm wondering if you could maybe just sort of explain to the people listening what risk parity is and why it's a good natural starting point for any kind of a person who takes a long term view. Sure. Look, the, what I've been talking about actually is just the plain idea of diversity. Mm -hmm. Risk parity is balancing your risk between those kind of three major buckets, right? Um, so let's give an example. I always like to talk about uh, skis and bikes, uh, to Canadians especially, right? In Canada, there are no ski stores and there are no bike stores. There are just skis and bike stores, right? Why? Why do they do that? Well, because half of the year, if you're just a bike store, you're going to make money in the summertime. And then in the wintertime, if you're just a bike store, you're going to kind of batten down the hatches, minimize your drag. You're going to have a drawdown in cash flows, but hopefully not too much because you're going to close everything down and then open back up for spring and start making sales again. If you're a, bike, if you're a ski store, it's going to be the other way around. But when you create a portfolio, a company that, that has a portfolio of skis and bikes, what you're doing is all the money that you made in the summer from bikes, you are going to reinvest it into your ski store. And then you're going to piggyback off of that excess cash flow into your bike seat, into your ski season to make more money for the summer. So you, you get diversity of cash flows. You get a much smoother ride as an investor. And you get what's called a rebalancing premium, where you're actually making money out of nothing. You're making money out of noise. Because that extra cash flow that comes from bikes, you actually get to grow your business more. So that's diversity. Now, the risk parity aspect of this is that you as a business owner, wouldn't uh, buy, you, you wouldn't create 10 bike stores and two ski stores because it would be unbalanced. You would be taking in your cash flows and your investments way more risk on the ski side of the business than the bike side. And this is what we do with a 60 40 portfolio, for example, right? From a risk perspective, equities have three times the risk of bonds. And so but we can measure this, and I mentioned this earlier in the podcast, that a 60-40 portfolio from a risk perspective is actually 90-10, meaning that over the next 10 days, if equities lose money every single day, that 60-40 portfolio will be down at 9 out of 10 days, right? And so that is kind of the idea behind the imbalance that exists today in today's thinking. We think about dollars. So if I do a $50 to equities and $50 to the bonds, I'm balanced. You are not. You need 20 to equities and 80 to 10 year treasuries in order to create a balanced portfolio, right? And so the idea of risk parity is not is about first diversity. You wanna have things that go up in inflation, commodities, that's your bucket number one. You wanna have commodities and tips. You wanna have your equities for, for growth and you wanna have your bonds for bear markets. And now you have a three piston motor, but you, don't, you wanna make sure that your pistons are equal diameters, right? You don't want one piston to be bigger than the other and dominate how fast that car is going when it's popping. Mm -hmm. So you have to measure every day the risk contribution that each one of them has, whether it's through correlations and in volatility, and make sure that instead of caring about the dollar weights, you care about the risk weights. And if you do that over and over again, remember we talked about getting paid for the risk you take? Mm -hmm. From our research as a passive global investor, if you invest in this way, global equities, global bonds, and global commodities, and you update your estimates, it, it is the best way as a long-only investor to, to maximize your return per unit of risk uh, and therefore get paid for the risk that you take. Let's talk then about um, managing risk using alternatives and specifically 
the alternative sleeve and the importance of having a, 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 a meaningful alternative sleeve if what, if what you're in for, and I'm not saying we are, but, it, but what if you're in for a prolonged multi-year bear market? Then, then tell me about how having a significant exposure to alternatives might help to mitigate that outcome. Well, yeah, and look, like I said, inflation regimes come in all shapes and sizes and bear markets come in all shapes and sizes. So risk parity should do a re decent job at minimizing the, that drag to the downside, right? The, the problem, you, you have three pistons and sometimes two of them go down. This year's a perfect example. We had equities and bonds go down while commodities went up, right? And so risk parity, while ha had, if you look at the S&P risk parity index, it's down eight, 9% versus global balance, which is down 14%, right? right. Um, but most of the time you'll find yourself in a situation when you have two out of the three of those pistons going up, okay? Um, but when do we see two pistons go down? It could be periods of quantitative tightening, right? When there's a sucking sound in liquidity and maybe it's a multi-year sucking sound uh, like we've seen in the last hundred years, then a long only portfolio as, as diversified and balanced as risk parity might be, will still have a little bit of that blind spot, a little bit of, of, of a lull. Um, it might be abrupt sentiment shocks like we saw in March, 2020. So if you examine the risk parity returns during that February, the first two weeks of February, risk parity actually was going up while the equity markets were going down. But it was that moment where people said, uh oh, the world is falling apart. I have cash is king. I'm going to sell my equities, my bonds, my gold, my commodities, and, and everything goes down together momentarily. Very, very rare. But those periods need to be, you need to fill in those gaps. And the only thing that really helps in those periods, quantitative tightening periods, is the ability to short. Okay. And so, if you go and look at all the alternative sleeves that are out there, this is part of the, the, the work I did early on in my career, and you look at your long short equities, your, your market neutrals, your uh, private equities, private credit, all of them have a high correlation to equities. So they're not useful if you're trying to find something that has zero low correlation to equities. So the asset, the alternative sleeve that I gravitated towards early in my career was the managed futures category. Mm -hmm. used to be popular in the 2000s, has not been popular because it's easier to make money in equities and bonds in the last 10 years. But this category has the ability to be net short everything, net long everything, or net neutral at any time. There's no long short equity funds tend to be like 100% long, 50% short. There's still this bias. This is a true, they will transition toward things that are working and away from things that are not, whether that means being net short everything or not. And when you have that, those categories, if you look it up in the HFRI index, you'll find that their correlation equities is about zero, correlation of bonds is about zero. That's the, the fourth piston you need in that portfolio to really have it be a all-terrain vehicle that your portfolio can, can get through. And so those types of funds, like our, our hedge fund strategy is up around 20% for the year, offsetting the losses of the risk parity strategy, right? And so you want to look for, in, in our opinion, that kind of ability to go anywhere all across equities, bonds, commodities, long and short, in order to be able to fill in the bear market gaps and the inflation gaps. It looks like 2023 is shaping up to be a challenging year. I'll, I'll, I'll use challenging as the euphemism. I think it's, I think a, a better word might be a little bit more, more, difficult than that, but let's just say it's going to be challenging. How would you advise people to get comfortable with being uncomfortable in a challenging environment? Yeah, well, I think you're, you're sourcing one of the articles that, that actually has been one of the most uh, sourced articles we've written. And it really comes down to you as an investor slash advisor have, have to come to terms with uh, being comfortable, being getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because the first level is if you're unwilling to change your ways and 60-40 is the only thing that you've educated yourself on, your clients on, and you have to do it, then it's going to be an, an uncomfortable conversation when you're discussing with clients about their purchasing power, that they're going to have to save more money, retire later, and be more conservative. I mean, that's the part of the level of uncomfortability that you have to have, conversation that you have to have as an advisor. If you're willing to take on the risk of going global diversification and adding to commodities, you're going to have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable about the, the non-correlative nature by which commodities act, 
and the way that global equities sometimes act and having those tough conversations where your domestic equities and bonds are crushing it and the other two aspects of your portfolio are not. But that's the whole point of having multiple pistons. And then the ultimate level of getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is what we've talked about, the alternative space. Luckily, now in the last couple of years, we talk about technology advancements that 40 years we didn't have, today we do. We have access to unique sources of risk in the ETF space, uh, commodity indices, you know, return stacked indices that are coming out uh, uh, and, and concepts like that that we can get into. We have uh, liquid alternatives over the last couple of years that have come to, to, to finally come to the Canadian market that allows us to add more diversity and protect against bear markets and protect against inflation regimes. Right. So there are multiple levels. You don't have to do in the alternatives. You don't have to go global, but you have to have tough conversations with clients. So you choose your poison, start going down that list. But there is no escaping that the next, you know, half a decade to a decade is going to be very different than the previous decade. And every one of us is going to be have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's one of the things I talk about in Bullshift, of course, is that people are overly optimistic and optimism bias is the sort of thing that uh, can be very dangerous because a lot of people think, oh, well, it always worked in the past. Why shouldn't it keep on working uh, going forward? But of course, the past is not prologue to what we might expect. And a lot of people, um, as we've talked about already on in, in this episode, that don't really act as students of history. They just think this is all I've experienced, therefore this is all there is, or all there ever could would, or would be. And I think that's a really, really dangerous attitude to take. How many come, people have come to me and said, man, this is unprecedented. I can't wait for the markets to get back to normal. Yeah. <laughs> Well, <laughs> actually, there are dozens of presidents if you go back far enough. Yeah, exactly. May have experienced the last 10 years, years is the abnormal part. Exactly. exactly. All right, uh, Rodrigo, I, we're just toward the end here. So I wanted to do, I always finish off uh, my, my podcast episodes with uh, two parts that I always talk about with my, uh, with my guests. And the first is called That's Bullshift. And That's Bullshift is where I invite you or whoever's uh, the guest this week to to talk about something that they think uh, maybe could be done differently and hopefully done better in the financial services industry. What do you think, uh, if, if you had a magic wand, what would you point to as being a, a, a problem? Well, I guess if you had your druthers, what, what would you point to as being a problem in the industry? Well, I think the slow speed by which we have as an industry put aside the alternative sleeve as a crucial aspect of portfolio construction. You know, un unfortunately, you know, and, and what I mean alternatives, I don't even mean that much of an alternative. We talked about commodities today in a commodity ETF and many broker dealers that is considered to take up the precious 15 to 20 percent of space that okay. a lot of broker dealers give their advisors in order to provide true balance. Right. So a lot of the concepts that I've talked about are simply not even doable. Mm -hmm. in traditional finance and traditional environments. And it's, it's sad because we have some of the brightest and most well-respected asset allocation shops in the world with the CPP, the Canadian Pension Plan, Ontario Teachers, Case. They are well-respected and all of them are doing what I've just described. They understand fully the value of balance and risk parity and, and managed futures. And none of that has trickled down into the powers that be on the in in the big banks, or if they have, you know, the those in the front lines doing alternatives within those broker dealers are, are I feel like are are winning the fight too slowly. So I call bull shift on that and hope that we get our acts together. I hope this is an eye-opening experience this year that we need to provide the tools that are very much available out there right now to exchange traded funds, mutual funds even offering memorandum funds to the, uh, the general financial public. Uh, we're doing them a disfavor. If we don't. Yeah. Okay, well, then that brings me to the second half, which is shift happens. So uh, you've already talked about what the problem is and uh, not enough uh, penetration and acceptance of alternatives. If you had your way, what would you do differently to, uh, to, to solve the problem? Well, you know, I think we need to have organizations, and, and there's a little bit of this, right? But a lot of this comes down from the CFA, so these professional societies, the Canadian Investment Management Association, the uh, or Canadian Investment Security, CIS, right? Um, the CFA, you know, the, the, the amount of time spent in 
that context in the alternative context is very little. You spend most of your time doing accounting work and very little time thinking about the portfolio construction process. And the reality is that it should be the other way around. We are told this line in finance that 95% of the impact to a portfolio is asset allocation. And yet we spend 95% in security selection, right? So the, the, the schema needs to flip. Mm -hmm. We need to get those, the CFA material, the, any sort of chartered anything to start with asset allocation, different optimization techniques, understanding the value of diversity, understanding the value of rebalancing premium. Like that's one of the things that is largely misunderstood. Oh, if equities give me the best return, then I should have 100% equities. No, because you're giving up on free money. And we talk about this in the book with Shannon's demon and the ability to, in our recent uh, paper that we wrote um, uh, about risk parity and the rebalancing premium, we talk about how you can create up to 4% returns, even if every one of those asset classes that we talked about today makes zero returns. Yeah, just because they're diversified and we're rebalancing and, mean, and the mean reversion between those things. So portfolio construction is the easiest and lowest hanging fruit. And we are setting that aside to focus on the 5% of impact of the portfolios and trying to find the best stock. Incorrect. And, and hopefully, I'm seeing a little bit of risk parity conversation in, with this new CFAs. Hopefully that continues. Well, thank you so much. This has been, uh, I think, illuminating for me. And I think the, the people listening have enjoyed it too. So Thanks so much, uh, Rodrigo, and, and uh, we will be seeing you as time goes on. Uh, looking forward to chatting with you again sometime down the road. Thanks, John. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Bullshift, the podcast, was created in support of John DeGuey's book, Bullshift, available now online and in bookstores everywhere. The comments and opinions are those of the author and his guests. They are for informational purposes and should not be construed as investment advice. John DeGuey is an author, public speaker, senior investment advisor, and portfolio manager at Wellington Altus Private Wealth. For more information about John and his books, please visit standup.today. Bullshift, the podcast, is produced by TalkShoe, a division of IOTUM.